فقد قال الله عز وجل في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد إن الذين كفروا سواء عليهم أأنزلتهم أم لم تنزلهم لا يؤمنون سبق الله مولانا العزيز إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم وسلم عليه We are about to embark upon certain verses of the Quran that are very relevant to us in our lives. Unfortunately, when we read these verses, we don't associate to them because on the face of it, they talk about a group of people who we have no direct relationship with or like what we'd like to assume that we have no direct relationship with. So Surah Al-Baqarah starts off with three groups of people, the people of Taqwa, or should I say the people who have, uh, who are icons in their personality for the dunya and the akhirah. And then it talks about a second group of people called the Kuffar, the non-believers. Then it talks about a third group of people called the Munafiqeen. And it describes psychological uh, states of mind of all three categories. We have, in the previous sessions, looked at the five, category, five um, pillars that underpin a healthy life in Iman. And if you're life isn't producing success, then you need to go back to the uh, um, drawing board and look where you are lacking in these five um, attributes. And the more you perfect the art of enacting these attributes in your life, the more successful you will be. And success is not just a measure based on financial success or health-based success. Uh, as in f being physically healthy, success has to be looked at from a global perspective. And your understanding then increases. But the next two categories of people, an understanding of them requires an understanding of something which I'm about to talk about today, which people of the seal actually don't talk about in great detail. Because the majority of the seeds written were for the public and they were simple and they were designed for people to read and rather than uh, uh, engage them in too much detail which could lead to their confusion the idea was to give them a very basic grounding but we are here to um, examine these verses and how relevant they are for us so in order for us to appreciate what the next two sets of people and what is being talked of for them, about them, we need to understand one concept. <clears throat> if you don't understand this concept, not only in these two categories will be confused, but throughout the Qur'an when you read, you won't be able to understand what's going on. So understanding the concept that I'm going to talk about today is vital, and you'll see why it's vital. You may think, well, it's just a concept, isn't it? But when I put it to you in these terms, that if I say today I'm going to talk about eyes, you will quickly uh, tune in because you've got eyes. So if there was a blind man sat in this audience and I said, let's talk about eyes, clearly he would say, well, that doesn't apply to me. So he wouldn't really be interested as such. And when you talk about something that belongs to you, you suddenly, oh, a pair of hands. Let's talk about hands today. Oh, I've got hands. So my interest will suddenly be there. But I'm going to talk about something today which is a part of every one of you here, which you have very little knowledge of, which you've heard about. But the problem is, science won't tell you anything about it. Because science is still undergoing a process of development. Science knows nothing about it. 
So what we have to do is go back to the manufacturer and ask the manufacturer, can you tell us a bit about this? It's like saying, can you tell a bit about my eyes to the manufacturer? Because you created me, you know my parts inside out. So now we're going to ask you about a part of us that is part of us, when I mean us, I don't mean just physically us, that is part of us before we were born, that is a part of us whilst we are alive, and will remain a part of us even when we die, as in physically die. Sure you're thinking, what part is this? And <clears throat> if you understand this part of you, this will change your perception of how you think and how you interpret things and how you behave. So what is this part? Is it the eyes? Is it the hands? Is it our legs? No. This part of our existence is called the heart. Science has no knowledge of it. Psychology is being developed to understand the heart, but because it can only see through a scan a piece of meat or a, a, an organ or a tissue, that, that's all it does. It pumps blood. Therefore, it can't understand anything beyond that. Once upon a time, science when it did a scan of the brain, all it could see was a mass of different kinds of meat, and it couldn't make heads or tails of what was what. As it developed, it realized, okay, this is this part, this is that part. But the heart is something that science offers no In fact, it dismisses the presence of the heart from, a, uh, uh, from its reality. All, it, all science offers you is heart. What is a heart? Heart pumps blood. That's it. There's no other function to the heart. Then when you go to, to a scientist and say, what do you mean then when I say to you, you broke my heart? The scientist will say, this is just an expression. Actually, this refers to your mind. That's what the scientist will say. It won't mean you broke my heart, as in my physical heart, you broke it, no? It means your mind. But the manufacturer, Allah Azza wa Jal, has given us so much information about the heart that we, and Allah and His Rasul them, have given us so much information. And this is the first time I'm actually, I have the privilege of piecing together this great jigsaw from the Quran and Sunnah, which in the way I, I, I propose to do, I haven't come across in any article. There's a reason for that. Because a lot of the articles about Quranic concepts are written by ulama, scholars. And scholars have a pair of glasses which allow them only to see in a certain context, and that is an academic context. If something doesn't measure up, they don't accept it. But then there's another group of people who study the Quran, and they are the people of the Sawaf. They wear a different pair of glasses. And they look at the Qur'an from a very different perspective. The best way to summarize how they both look is what Hazrat Shah Waliullah Muhammad the Hindi says. He says there are two dimensions to a verse of the Qur'an. One is the external and one is the internal. So the ulama will point towards the external, but that's it. But the people of the Sawaf will look at the internal. And very seldom do you get someone who has the capacity to relate to both so, a lot of what Sheikh Al Akbar Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi has written, it goes over the head. People can't understand because he wrote his tafsir from a pure Tasawwuf based perspective. And then you have others who write it, who try to look at it from a philosophical perspective, like Imam Fakhr Razi. He looks at it from philosophy. But then, uh, uh, philosophy is not the end all, there is more to learn than philosophy. That's why Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, wrongly criticized uh, Fakhr Razi and said, Kullu illa tafsir. everything is in his tafsir except for tafsir itself. So basically, he's you know, gone on a void of discovery on each verse on philosophy. So very rarely you have a combination of both. The day and age that we live in, our loyalty is not to one or the other, our loyalty is to that which is relevant to us. And if we can get it from one camp, Let's get what we can get. And if we can get it from another camp, let's get what we get. So 
When we look at the word qalb, we will look at it from that uh, broad base, not just from the perspective of one group. So the word heart in the Arabic language has two specific words, the connotations are different in the name, but sometimes the Quran refers to the word uh, uh, heart by looking at the general geography of it and saying sadr. Sadr means chest. Musa yeah? uh, 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 says, Qala Rabbi Shahri Sadri, O Allah, open my heart. So, sadr. It doesn't mean open my chest, as in physically open my chest. It means open my heart. Like what Allah says, Alam nashrah laka sadra. Did we not open your heart? So, my emphasis is going to be on the word that we understand, and that is the word qalb, heart. But in the Quran, the word uh, uh, heart has come in two words. Two words have been used to talk about the word qalb in the Quran. One is the physical uh, uh, qalb, the physical heart, which you can see through a scan. And in Arabic and in the Quran generally, it's referred to as al fuad. Fuad refers to the physical heart. But when the Quran talks about the, now if you allow me to use this word, metaphysical heart, the heart that you can break, that you broke my heart, that heart, the word qalb is used. But the, before we dive into the qalb and understand, because when you understand the qalb, you'll understand these verses in a different context altogether. Otherwise, it'll just be, yeah, 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 the kuffar are like this, and the, and the, and the uh, uh, you know, like, well, uh, um, inna ladhina kafaru, those who uh, disbelieve, sawa'un alaykim, uh, sawa'un alayhim anzaltahum am lam tunzilum la yu'minu. It's the same whether you tell them or warn them or whether you don't warn them. This is, uh, uh, these are the hallmarks of uh, narcissistic tendencies, where whether you tell someone or whether you don't tell them, it doesn't bother them. But this narcissistic state of mind is not entrenched here, it's entrenched in the heart. So we need to understand the heart and its reality. But let me go back to what I said to you a few weeks ago and set the scene by that. If you recall, we said that there are five sources of knowledge. Five sources. The first two of those five sources are the province of science. Science cannot go beyond these two uh, sources of knowledge. And that's why we say science is empirical. What it sees, what it can rationalize, it will accept. What it can't rationalize, it won't accept. So the first source of knowledge is your external five senses. How do I know this is hard? I touch it. How do I know it smells nice? I smell it. The second source of knowledge is your akal. And your akal, um, intellect or rationale, tells you that one plus one equals two. Or, to be kind is good. That's not something which you can perceive. To be kind is good. To be cruel is bad. This is something the akal delivers to you. These are two sources. So philosophy and science, they revolve around these two sources. Beyond that, they're bankrupt. They have no ability to go beyond that. They wish they could. And because they couldn't, they created technology. And what technology does, it enhances their ability to what they couldn't see, to see. What they couldn't hear, to hear. What they couldn't rationalize, to rationalize. But they're still stuck on those two sources. Now let's look at the third source. Where you have external five senses, you have internal five senses. So, look, when you close your eyes, you see people you've never seen in your life. How does science rationalize that? It can't. Because if I have seen you, I have captured an image of you in my mind. So if I see you when my eyes are closed, i.e. in my dream, even though I, like that, I don't like that word, in my dream, in my vision is the correct word. That's quite understandable because I've seen you. So to see you when my eyes are closed is easy. But how do I explain where if I haven't seen you, I see you when my eyes are closed. And then I see you. I saw you before. In, in, in English they just refer, deja vu, that's it. 
How does science understand, understand a premonition? You saw an accident. It happened. Science has no understanding of this. So the third source of knowledge in the Quran and Sunnah is your internal five senses. You see, you hear, you smell. But how much of that memory is retained in your corpus when you wake up? That's a separate subject. But whatever is retained, you are able to remember the following morning. Okay. Then you have the fourth source of knowledge, which is the way you have an ex in external intellect, you have an internal intellect. And that intellect is based not here, it's based here. At this juncture, I want to present to you a, di a, a discourse between Hanafis and Shafis on the point of compensation. And if someone A injures B, B is entitled to compensation, it's us. So Imam Azam Abu Hanifa rahmah, says that if you strike someone's head, because the atal is in the head, therefore you must compensate for depriving him or her of his akal or her akal, because the atal is based there. Imam Shafi rahmah, says, no, the akal is based in the heart. And so therefore, by giving him an injury on the head, you haven't deprived him of akal. Therefore, the same compensation doesn't apply. It's a question of quantum, isn't it? A person losing his brain and a person losing his feet are two different things from a quantum perspective, with damages perspective. So Imam Azad says, well, you hit, strike someone on the head, the akal is here, you hit the person, he becomes insane, naturally, because the blow is so much, you can't, he can't, uh, uh, have, the cognitive function is gone. Therefore, the kisas must be, the compensation must be for the akal, loss of akal, and the damage is done accordingly. Imam Shafi says no. And he has his denial. He's not just saying it, the, he quotes verses of the Quran. They have hearts through which they understand. So I'm not going to go into that dispute, but what I want to say is that the people who have really understood and rectified this are the people who have an understanding of the inner dimensions of the Quran. The, the, and they have said that there are actually two akhars, the external akhar, the mahal al the uh, location, geographic location of your external akhar is in your brain. But you have another akhar which is based in your heart. That's your internal intellect. So when your brain is switched off at night when you are sleeping, you engage in conversation with people in a, in, in, using cognitive uh, faculties, using rationale. You talk to people. Someone says to you, how are you? I am okay. That requires a, a, a cognitive function. Uh, if there's no cognitive function, someone asks you, how are you? Sir? don't know. I'm done. I, I, I can't hear or understand what you're saying. So, <coughs> the uh, 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 people of Ma'rifa have said that the akal of the heart is a different akal. The distinction between the two akal will become uh, apparent in a minute. The akal of the brain is none other than a calculator. Whatever you put in it, it processes. But then there is another akal where you make decisions via that akal and sometimes you even dispense of this akal. For example, a rishta comes to you. You are told, don't go for this rishta. There is this wrong in her, there is that wrong in her, there is this wrong in her, there is this wrong in her. Your uncle says, beware, but your heart says, nah. <laughs> this is all of my dreams, that's it. So you made a decision not based on this akal, you made it based on this akal. So this akal is something. This akal has its own tenets, it has its own protocols. So where is this akal based? In the heart, kal. Now, and the fifth source of knowledge, by the way, which the Quran again talks about, is ilham. Ilham. Ilham means inspiration. And we as humans, not only humans, by the way, even non-humans, 
have the facility of inspiration, revelation. فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا So there's two kinds of ilham. Ilham min Allah, min al-Rahman, inspiration from Allah. And ilham min al-Shaytan. Shaytan is ilham also. So ilham is the fifth source of knowledge. Sometimes you will behave and your behavior will be dictated by ilham without you even knowing it. But ilham is not my subject today. My subject is we are going to look at the qalb, the heart. Because this, if you allow me to use this word, limb of ours, science has nothing to offer us, but we're going to ask the Quran and Sunnah. Explain to us, what is this piece of our us that has such a huge impact? Look, I often say that our, dictate, our life at various stages is dictated by love. Whether that's love for our children, wife, or neighbor, or whoever. But there isn't a course that you can find in any university in the world that deals with love, or the concept of love. Why? Because the love that Hollywood and Bollywood promote is the love of the mind. The problem with that love is you don't know when you're in love with it, and you don't know when you're out of love. But real love and the love of the heart, as Ghalib says, Ishtu atish e Ghalib, lagayana lagayana bujayana bujayana. That once that love from the heart is truly uh, enlightened, then no matter how hard you try, you can't, in you can't uh, 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 have it enlightened. And once it's enlightened, you can't pull it out. That, it's a fire which you can't pull out. So it, it's not a case of, well, you didn't text me, or you didn't remember my birthday, you didn't remember the anniversary, I don't love you anymore. That's the love from the mind. You did not do this, you did not. That's the love of the mind. The love of the heart is blind, and my subject is not love today. But love, where does it come from? It comes from the heart. Which heart? This heart. But science only shows you a, 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 a tissue that just pumps, and that's all science has got to offer you. But let's ask the Quran and Sunnah. Tell us about this color. We want to know about this color. So the Prophet وسلم, educates us in the Quran. There is. Uh, uh, over 162 ayats on just on the word qalb in the Quran. I haven't got the time to go through each one of them. But I have tried to bring the jigsaw together. And as we go along, that jigsaw will only be further populated. But I want to give you enough of a big the jigsaw today that hopefully you'll actually start to be able to put pieces together in your life. Why did I make that decision? Why did I do this? Why did I do this? When you understand your qalb and the basis of that decision, or the basis of your actions, or the basis of your behavior, you understand yourself far more. So the Prophet ﷺ, uh, uh, starts uh, uh, the discussion in this, and this is a muttafiq alayhi hadith in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah, wa in the fil jasadi mudghatun, in the body of a human being there is a mudgha, a piece of meat. Mudgha means piece of meat. Is a salahat salahan jasadu kullu. If that piece of meat within the body, if that is rectified, if that is upright, salaha, if that is healthy, then the whole body is healthy. However, wa ida fasadah, if that is corrupt, fasadan jasadu kullu, the whole body is corrupt. Now, this is not talking about heart problems, by the way. This is not talking about uh, someone who has angina. This is not talking, this is about talking about the thing in the body. What is that? Uh, a piece of meat. But it's not just a piece of meat. The next hadith which I'm about to tell you gives you, a, and you have to really, really, and I'm going to take it nice and slow, because this one's really set the thing in motion. The Prophet is reported to have said, O Qamaqala alayhi salatu wasalam, Inna fi jasadil insani mudhatun. Inside the body of the human is a mudha, a piece of meat. Wa fil mudhati fu'adun. And inside that piece of meat, you see, is a fu'ad, a physical heart. So, mudha is the chest, yeah? And fu'ad is the physical heart, which you can see in a scan. Fu'ad. Remember I told you in the beginning? Fu'ad. 
But then, then the Prophet says, well, fin fu'adi qalbun. And inside that physical heart, there is a metaphysical heart. Qalbun. That's where you broke my heart comes in. Yeah? Or my heart. As I say, Urdu, mera dil aapko milke baag baag hua. If you translate it in English, literally, if you are a literalist, my heart was guarding, guarding to see you. <laughs> That's this heart. But the Prophet didn't just stop there. He said, look, chest, piece of meat. In that, there's a physical heart. In the physical heart, or fil fu'adi, qalbun. Are you all with me? I have to say this very, very slowly. But then he said, wa fil qalbi and inside that um, that metaphysical heart is your room. That's where your room is located. The geography of your room. In, here it's the opposite way around. The heart is in my body. But that physical heart, sorry, that metaphysical heart, it's not in your soul, the soul is in your metaphysical. You see, the, it's the total opposite. You know, if I go up to someone and say, my heart is in my body, people will say, yeah, that's scientifically correct. If I say, my soul is in my heart, it should be the other way around, shouldn't it? Your heart is in your soul. Your color should be in your... I want you to remember this in the back of the mind. It's the other way around. The qalb is not in the soul, the soul is in the qalb. And then the hadith carries on. It says, وَفِلْ قَلْبِ رُوحٌ وَفِلْ رُوحِ نُورٌ And inside your soul there is light. Inside your soul there is light. As in, your soul is made of light. What we call jismin latif, the, meta, uh, the metaphysical body, that soul is made of light. I'm not going to go into technical detail, but uh, the mutakallimin, they say, what is the definition of innahu jasadun latifun shaffafun nurun hayyun lizatihi? They define the soul, the people of Kala, in a mutakallimin. But we're not going to go into that. The hadith says, and within the soul is a light. Within the soul is light. Wafil rui nur, and in the soul is light. The soul is made of light, but there is a light in the soul. So you have an external shell, and within the internal shell of the soul there is light. And then the hadith finishes off with an absolutely jaw-dropping, mind-boggling ending, and it says. This is Hadith Qudsi. Hadith Qudsi means that which Allah said in the Prophet has been repeating. And the Hadith says, O Afin Nuri Ana, and I am in that light. Allah Azza wa Jal But it doesn't mean to say that Allah is here and not there. That presence in is not in the same way as I say the water is in the bottle. If you say Allah is in, that's incorrect. Why? Because Allah is not limited to time and space. You cannot encircle uh, 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 in, uh, in time and space around Allah. If you allow me, as uh, near Muhammad al Fikari, he, uh, uh, he summarizes this conundrum in one uh, uh, of his uh, shares. About Allah, he says, "Aap makano khali, khali usti koi makan." No, he, the, he, Allah Azza wa Jal is free from makan, free from space, but no space is free from Him. How Allah is present, we don't know. Like the Quran says, "Ar Rahmanu ala al Arsh istawa." Allah is dominant over the Arsh. How He is present there, we don't know. That's why we any verse in which a, 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 a suggestion is made of Allah that we would apply our logic to or our rational to, 
the ulama stop you there and say, listen, this is what we call mutashabiha. You cannot rationalize this. So when we say Allah's face, you cannot say your face like Allah's face. No. What Allah's face, face is, we don't know. We know that Allah has a face. What face that is, we don't know. It's kama sha'nu, according to his sha'n. Kama yaliku bi sha'ni, according to his sha'n. Allah has hands, but not the way we have hands. But we cannot rationalize or uh, 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 make that similar. Our hands, Allah's hands, no. So we have all these verses in the Quran that talk about Allah in this way, they are called mutashabi'ah. Mutashabi'ah means that you cannot uh, uh, rationalize these or understand them through your intellect. So uh, uh, there, and that's why ulama don't even touch those verses. They say, sorry, we can't deduct law from these verses. We can't deduct aqidah from these verses. Why? Because the true meaning of these verses, Allah is Rasul no better. But the people of the uh, uh, Batin, the, uh, the uh, 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 ulama who are arifin, they don't stop there. They explore further, but with caution. And with caution means they don't advertise to the world what they find, because it would only confuse uh, 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 the world if the world started engaging with that material. So, Allah is saying, in that light, I am there. It doesn't mean to say Allah is physically there, or it doesn't suggest that Allah is there to the exclusion of, no. How he is there? We don't know how he is there. But this is a, 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 a this hadith gives us a, a geographical uh, understanding of these entities. Because my object of presenting this hadith wasn't to talk about Allah's presence. Uh, 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 my purpose was to talk about the geography of the heart. So what did we establish thus far? In the body, in this body, in this uh, 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 piece of meat, uh, there is a fu'ad, in the fu'ad is the qalb. In the qalb, there is a soul. In the soul, there is light. Let's just stop there. That's why the Prophet said, when the heart, when he says the heart is corrupt, the whole body is corrupt. What does he mean? He means the metaphysical heart, not the physical heart. Yeah? He means the metaphysical heart. And the metaphysical heart houses the soul. Your soul is in there. Let's move on. Uh, so, let's just look a bit of a, a biography of the soul. Where does the soul come from? What is the impact of this soul upon the human being? These are two very important questions. Now, psychologists come into this equation and they say, what affects my behavior? Nature or nurture? Is it my nurture? Nurture means DNA uh, 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 and other things that are part of my uh, physical uh, uh, brain that define who are my behavior? Or is it, uh, uh, sorry, uh, nature as in how I was created, my DNA, or nurture, how I was brought up, what I was exposed to. Clearly, the mindset of a Palestinian child and a child living in uh, Small Heath in Birmingham is going to be very different. Because what they are exposed to is very different. And therefore, what they are exposed to fashions their behavior, their mindset. That's what you call nurture. But how does the soul affect our nature or nurture? That's a question which we have to ask ourselves. How does it affect us? Let's just do a bit of Sherlock Holmes in this. Let's do a bit of investigation. Firstly, where did this soul come from? Where did this soul come from? Well, we know where our body came from. Our body came from our parents. Yeah, I don't need to remind you of the stages. <laughs> yeah, you know, as one island wanted to patronize this young man and said, Do you know who you are? He says, No, and he said, Do you know you, you dirty drop of water? And he, he became very feisty and angry and said, oh, He said, No, I, I didn't say that. The Quran says that. <laughs> so, our bodies came from our parents. Where did their bodies come from? Their parents. Let's forensically go back. Where did their bodies come from? All went back to Adam and Islam. 
Where did Adam Islam's physical body come from? Where did his physical body come from? There were two components that made the body of the khamir of Adam a.s. Four, and this is in hadith, four corners of this earth, angels came, an angel came, took four pieces of this earth, put it together, but you need water. You can't just get cement and start trying to build a wall with it. You need water. So where was the water? The water was from Jannah. It's written in the hadith. The water was from Jannah. Now you understand why uh, as a Sultan Bahu Rahma says, Nakar minnat khaj khizadi. You know, uh, Hazrat Khaj Khizad drinks water every hundred years and it replenishes his organs so that he has immortality up till the time when Allah will give him death. Uh, or according to some, he's already died. But the point is that he has immortality and there are other immortal species that live on this earth. But that water which he drinks is called Abe Hayat, the water of life. As the Sultan Bahu says to the, you know, uh, uh, to the Salik, he says, why do you want to find Hazrat uh, Khizr? So you can ask him, excuse me, can you tell me where that water is? Because I want to be water like you. He says, Nakar minnat khal khizrdi tere andar aab hayati ho. Inside you is that water that you're looking for. And that water is immortal. And that water, ultimately, no matter how you die, where you die, will house itself in your spinal cord, which is, which I call, according to the Hadith, I'm not going to go into detail on this, which I call the black box of the body. Indestructible. The Prophet said is a piece of your body that is indestructible, that houses your DNA, your personality and everything in there. Why? Because it is uh, 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 reinforced by that immortal element of Jannah, that water. So that is what you call a uh, biography of our physical body. Now let's look at a bio biography of our soul. Where did our soul come from? Where did our soul come from? <coughs> not, not those who attend the CFT and uh, course. Where do where our souls come from? Al 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 correct. So as a starting point, our souls do not come from our parents. That's the point. Alam al if I just to translate that in, in English, it means the zone of souls. Yeah? The zone of souls. So whereas your body came from your parents, your soul doesn't come from your parents. Your soul has an independent existence, independent to your parents. So from a soul perspective, you are on par with your parents. It, from a soul perspective. Yeah. So where did the soul come from in Alam al Let's just go back a bit. What's the history of the soul? Well, if you remind yourself, when Allah Azza wa Jal, the Hadith says, um, Allah Azza wa Jal, according to His Majesty, rubbed the back of Adam alayhi salam, according to his majesty. How he did it, we don't know. Masaha, the word masaha is used in Hadith. And when he rubbed from within Adam alayhi salam, right and left souls came out. And there, weren't, there wasn't chaos, there wasn't anarchy. Because the Prophet says, Al-Arwahu Junudun Munjannadun. They are like an army, they are, they, they, they are like you know, conscripts of an army. Very disciplined, they all came out, right and left. Those who came out from the right, they were the souls whose destiny was Jannah. And those who came out from the left, their destiny was Jannah. Of course, please don't ask me the question of Qadr now. <laughs> well, if I was destined to be a Jannah, why do I need to do what I do? That's not something I'm going to talk about today. The question here is, where did our soul come from? It came from the body of Adam Alayhi So one man housed trillions of souls. For us, we just about grapple with the idea that a woman who is pregnant houses two souls. Or if she's got triplets, or if she's got quadrants. 
many souls in one. But the idea of housing trillions of souls in one body, this is Adam Islam. Welcome to Adam Islam. And then the question is, when the souls were taken out, they gathered together, very organized, constricted, no one needed to be there, get it ordered, no? Junudun mujannadun. In order, lines. And their manufacturers went to them. A baby is born, you go and speak to the baby. You will qualify under the NHS for treatment. How can a baby have a rational conversation with you? His cognition is underdeveloped. His uh, 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 capacity to speak is underdeveloped. And you're having a conversation with the baby. I'm, I'm not talking about that conversation where your parents go, oh, you teeny little thing, you messed up. Not that conversation. That's what you call la and piyad. I'm talking about a rational conversation. That Allah Azza wa has a rational conversation with us, with our souls. And what is that rational conversation? This is a rational question. And Lord, this translation is wrong. Am I not your Lord? Many translators have translated this is wrong. Lord is Mawla. Rab is the one who sustains Murabbi. Am I not your sustainer? Am I not, not, uh, not, am I not your creator? Or am I not your, uh, 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 the one to be worshipped? It is, am I not your sustainer? This requires a knowledge of the past, present and future. And the souls spontaneously, without being educated, without having any degrees, without having any uh, 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 um, uh, faculties to be, to be developed, they spontaneously responded, oh yes, of course you are. So there was a conversation, there was a rational conversation. So then, where was our, so our soul was in the body of Adam Islam, then where did the soul of Adam Islam come from? After all, if our souls were in his soul, were in his body, in his soul, then where did his soul come from? The Quran speaks. So when his khamir, his statue was made, all you saw was a statue, lifeless. Exactly like you see in a mortuary. Lifeless. A piece of meat. No action. No movement. And then Allah says in the Quran, And we blew our soul into him. Again, from our soul will not say that Adam and Islam's soul is part of Allah. That's shirk. Why? Because lam yalid wa lam yulad. So, we say with the barakah of Allah Azza wa Jal, with the barakah, with the blessing of Allah's soul, the soul was put into Adam al Islam. So our soul is from Adam al Islam, Adam al Islam's soul. And the mystery continued, but I'm not going to carry on. Because there were those who lived before Adam al Islam. And one of those who lived before Adam al Islam. His name was Muhammad <laughs> So at what stage the song of the Prophet also came from within Adam? So that's why when the Prophet was asked by his companions, Mata, Wajabat uh, Nabuwa, when was when were you a Nabi? He didn't say when Adam alayhi salam when I came out of Adam alayhi salam, he says no. The way I explain this is if a very, very old man is approached by a two, three year old child and says, Old man, when, uh, since when have you learned to read the Quran? Now, if the old man says 50 years, it means nothing to a two year old child. <laughs> 50 years means nothing. So to explain to the two, three year old child, he says, Beta, <laughs> Your father wasn't even born and I used to read the Quran. So the little child in his mind said, Oh, he's been reading the Quran a long time. Even my father wasn't even born. When the Sahaba asked, When were you a Nabi? He said, Even when your father wasn't even born, <laughs> I was a Nabi. 
كنت نبيا وعادم بين الماء والتين. When your father, our father was between mud and water, I was still a nabi. Well, how were you a nabi? That's a separate question for a separate day. But we, as our souls, have a forensic path in hadith that goes back to the the body of Adam alayhi salam. But there are those who have realized that whilst our bodies were released through, uh, our soul was released through Adam alayhi salam, there is a biography that goes beyond, that, uh, that precedes Adam alayhi salam. I'm not going to go into that. I think for now, if we just say our soul has a direct connection with Adam alayhi salam, is that fair? And is it fair to say then, our soul has a direct connection with Allah. That's what distinguishes us from the souls of animals, from the souls of angels, from the souls of jinns. We have a direct link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as human beings. Now, within that soul, so, no, so that soul, when it comes, it houses itself in the qalb, in the metaphysical heart. So, nature and nurture, the argument is, I am what my DNA is. So, if my DNA said blue eyes, I have blue eyes. My genetic makeup can be seen now by science. In fact, there is a further branch of science which is progressing very, with a lot of pace, and that is called behavioral genetics where they can study your genetics to the extent that they can say, this is an angry child. This is a polite child. This is a kind child. They can almost now, be, uh, I'm not saying in totality, no, I mean, the technology where, oh yes, this child will have uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, this height or th this physical attribute, this is old technology. Now it's behavioral genetics. How does this child, um, uh, 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 his behavior. So some of your behavior, this, this is called behavioral genetics, but the Hadith talks about behavioral genetics 1400 years ago, and says, behavioral genetics? Yes. You are kind because your father was kind. You inherited that. Fine, science will understand that. But there are certain attributes which were inserted in your DNA. How? Hadith of the Prophet where um, the Prophet says, Yes. At the time in the mother's womb, after a certain period, I'm not going to go into detail, after a certain period, the zygote, the the, that, that creation reaches a stage where the soul is breathed into, the angel breathes the soul into that piece of meat. That juncture is 120 days. Up to 120 days, in that piece of meat there is no soul. That doesn't mean to say you can abort at 120 days, because if your argument is no soul, no life, then when your neighbor goes to sleep, you can kill him and get away with it. Because no soul, no life. Sleep is the sister of death. The Quran teaches us that I'm not promoting murder, by the way. Because science tells us that when we sleep, and the Quran tells us, the soul is no longer in the body. So when the soul is no longer in the body, so then we, call, we classify that body as dead. I didn't kill him, he was already dead. No. <laughs> Please don't get any ideas. <laughs> so, um, that fetus, which has developed 140 days, the soul may, be not, may not be in it, but it is associated to it. But a time comes when the angel, and this is in Bukhari, the angel who is appointed as a guardian to the, in that womb, oh yes, an angel is appointed as a guardian in that womb. And the angel reports to Allah, oh Allah, it's at this stage, as if Allah doesn't know, Allah knows. Protocol, isn't it? <laughs> it's protocol. 
But then a stage comes where the angel says, and then he says, Qala, ay rabbi, o rabbi, azakal, am unfa, is it going to be male or is it going to be female? So gender is dictated not from the beginning. The decision of gender is given at 120 days. It's given. Of course, Allah has made that decision before. But uh, 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 no one knows, has that knowledge. Uh, does anyone know at what stage you can find out the gender of a child? 20 weeks. 20 weeks? 20 weeks, look at that. But the Quran says 121, the 120 days, gender is determined. So the angel says, uh, um, uh, Azakal, this is Hamza Estefania. Larkaya, am Unta, or is it a female? And then look at the next. It says, Ashakiyun am Saidun. Is he going to be wretched? Is he going to be an evil person? Am Saidun, or is he going to be a good person? That is planted, that is knowledge of the soul which is then planted into your DNA at that stage. The knowledge is already there, Allah has that knowledge. But He reveals that knowledge at that juncture on your DNA. So your father could be a very angry person, but Allah could say, no, I'm going to change this feature of his DNA and I'm going to make him a very kind person, a very soft-hearted person. That's why sometimes you see uh, children sometimes do the opposite of their parents because Allah has but the question is how much does the soul impact your DNA have you heard the, uh, the, the great phrase in English it is a great phrase English only has a few great phrases you are the company you keep so the soul is pure even the soul of Adolf Hitler Benito Mussolini, even though they were pure butchers, Joseph Stalin, in their original Alam al they were pure and they were mu'min. Oh yes, they also responded, Bala. But the company of that soul on that uh, body means that that uh, body, that DNA genetic code, is affected by the attributes of that soul. And this is explained in the Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. How a soul affects your genetic makeup. The Prophet ﷺ says, um, uh, that Hadith I recite, Al Arwah, Junudun Mujannadun. The Arwah are like an army, disciplined. They know their place, they know their rank. Fama ta'arafa minha. If they recognize someone who they knew there, they become very attracted to them. And if they didn't get on over there, they don't get on over there. So that soul in Alam al Arwah had a personality. That personality has an impact here. So if you got on with someone there, you get on with someone here. And if you didn't get on with someone there, no matter how much you eat them, you'll never get on with them. So it means that this was in our nature. From our rule, our personality was shaped and it shaped our DNA. So our heart houses a set of uh, 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 um, factors, some entrenched in DNA, uh, DNA uh, genetics, and some entrenched from our soul. And that was the history. But now the heart is given a body. Now there are other forces that will affect this heart. And it's not getting too complicated, is it? There are other forces that affect this heart. So the first force that affects this heart is your own actions. Up to the age of puberty, there is an insurance policy in place. Whatever you do, you're covered. No sin written. Yeah, no sin written for you. Kullu, the Prophet says, Kullu, Every newborn 
So a child who is born in a Hindu home, who up to the stage of puberty does Ram, 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 Shiv, 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 one day before reaching the age of puberty he dies, where does he go? Jannah. Goes to Fitra. So, that, uh, but paradoxically, um, a person who is in Iman after puberty, if his deeds, the Prophet says, after puberty, this is what happens. And this is a saying at least also. In the mu'mina idha adnaba, when a mu'min sins, kanat nuqtatun sawdau fi qalbihi, a black dot comes on his heart. فَإِنْ تَعْبَى If he does Tawbah, وَالنَّزَعَ وَاسْتَغْفَرَ And he asks for forgiveness from Allah, سُقِلَ قَلْبُهُ His heart is wiped out. Okay. So every time you do guna, dot on the heart. If you do Tawbah, istighfar, goes away. But if you don't, فَإِنْ زَادَ And if he carries on that sin without doing uh, Tawbah, فَإِنْ زَادَتْ فَزَالِكَ فَزَالِكَ رَعْمَ الَّذِي زَكَرَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فِي قَلْبِهِ Then that dot becomes another dot, another dot, another dot, another dot, till the whole heart becomes black. Now the question is, what happens when the heart is black? What are the consequences of a black heart? Or a heart which is dotted? Please remember that question. I can't answer it now. I thought I would cover this whole thing in one session, but no. I hope you will come back with questions. What are the consequences when that heart is dotted? The consequences to our life practically. Does that person who has lots of dots on his heart become evil? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. But what is the difference between the heart of a kafir and the heart of a mu'min? The heart of a munafir? Now you'll understand what Allah says, in their heart is a disease. So you can't go around and say anyone who has heart disease is a monophic. <laughs> Why? Because that refers to the qalb. There is a disease in their heart. So this heart is prone to many forces. Many, many forces. And depending on which forces dominant over the heart, the heart has its uh, a status determined. If those forces, if the forces of evil are dominant, then disease sets into that heart. Fi qulubi in maradun, in their heart is a disease, the Quran says. Fazada And a stage comes when, and I'm going to explain this, when, when the verses of the Quran come, then you'll understand this. A stage comes where the heart becomes so black, so black, that heart no longer can see, hear, understand. It cannot understand. But as long as that heart is healthy, there's what you call a dead heart, and there's what you call a diseased heart. So when a heart is dead, the Quran refers to that and says to the Prophet Sallallahu <laughs> Allah was not referring to dead people. He was referring to those people whose heart is alive, they were living, but Allah classifies them to be dead by virtue of their heart. These dead people don't hear you. Dead people doesn't mean they are physically dead, it means their heart is dead. But then there's a heart with disease. That heart we're going to talk about. But what are the consequences of that? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Quran uh, uh, tells us at this juncture. And this is uh, there's a lot in here. Afalam yasiru fil ardi, fatakuna lahum qulubun yaqulun biha. Do you not travel the earth? Allah is encouraging us to go on holiday. He's not saying sit in your little pond. He's saying ponder beyond the pond. Ponder beyond the pond. Yeah. 
Afan and Yasin, do you not travel the earth? Have you not? Have they not traveled the earth? So we give them hearts through which they understand. Hearts through which they understand. Science says brains through which they understand. But the Quran says hearts through which they understand. Oh, yasma'una biha, or ears which they hear through. But the, the, the hearts through which they hear, uh, through which they understand, that's this heart, not this heart. Why? This heart is very cunning. This, this akal is very cunning. If I know this person is going to be of use to me, and this person can be of benefit to me, my attitude towards him will be different towards the person who I know is of no use to. Akal ayyar hai, so ves badalti hai. Akal is very cunning, so it changes its colors. But this heart is very straightforward. It's, it operates on different tenets. This is a calculator. This is not a calculator. This operates on different uh, 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 um, uh, pretenses. I don't have the time to conclude what I want to say to you today. But I've instigated a huge topic, which in every spot of the Quran, you will find verses. If you understand this concept of Akal, which you have inside you, it'll make not only your practical lives easy, but even understanding the rest of the Quran more easy. So we have a qal, we have a qal, and I'm going to conclude with one thing today, which a lot of you uh, may be aware of, may not be aware of. Hazrat Dr. Alama Iqbal Rahma, spent a huge emphasis in his latter life talking about one concept. And what concept was that? That concept was khudi, khudi, and I'm not going to recite those ashar now. You know, khudi ko kar bolen din. Now you heard all the shit, but he says in one of his shares of khudi, he says khudi ka sirre niha la ilaha illallah. If you understand this verse, you'll understand a lot what the Quran and Sunnah is talking about when it comes to the heart, to the root. Khudi ka sirre niha. La ilaha illallah. Iqbal had already reached there. But what was he referring to when he was saying khudi? What is khudi? You won't find any khudi in the Quran. No translation of the Quran, all the translation of the Quran will talk about khudi. But when Iqbal talked about, Allama Iqbal talked about khudi, he was referring to the heart. Now if you reread all those ash'ar of Allama Iqbal, where he says khudi, khudi ko karbunan. Therefore, the heart which you have in your chest, don't underestimate this heart. This heart is a very ancient species. You don't have to go and search museums for antiques. The biggest antique is here. But if you understand the history of this heart, the reality of, it, of this heart, it will change your life. Wa ma'alayna illa al